Lord and Savior, welcome to worship. It is wonderful to be with you both, or with you all, rather, uh, out here listening. Yeah, all two of you. Uh, it is wonderful to be out here worshiping under God's beautiful, good creation, hearing the sounds of it, and uh, just having the chance to worship and fellowship together. Uh, what a wonderful day this is. Uh, as you probably are aware of, we are collecting uh, uh, diapers and car seats and packing plays and all the like. Uh, to support Mercy Mall. As I was thinking about Resurrected Life this year, I thought, uh, gosh, what a great thing to support an organization that supports new life in our community. And uh, so we're delighted uh, to share uh, some of these with Mercy Mall. Uh, we're sponsoring specifically their infant room uh, today, but uh, they, they take care of members of our community who find themselves in times of crisis unexpectedly, be that domestic violence or some other situation where they're left with almost nothing. Um, so they're able to provide housewares, clothing, things of that nature. Uh, but again, this morning we are supporting the infant room. Uh, as uh, we bought diapers and uh, as uh, one of Nicole's coworkers bought uh, diapers and delivered them to our house, they were sort of stacking up near the front door and Ethan comes around the corner and he looks at all these baby diapers and he said, wait, what? <laughs> So I have no announcements in that regard this morning, just that we're collecting donations for Mercy. Uh, what a great organization to support. If you haven't had the chance to bring yours up here and you'd still like to contribute, uh, we're not gonna take them up until Tuesday, so you can bring them up. We have bins outside the common stores, and uh, so you can bring those between now and then. Uh, as you know, next week, we're gonna start a new sermon series called uh, Reopening Christianity. And, uh, well, it's an exciting time to look at, you know, as we're kind of emerging from the past year, what things do we bring back? What things maybe we don't need to bring back? Uh, it's a great study on Right Now Media, and um, we'll not only be looking at it from the pulpit, but also in your small groups. And so if you are not yet in a small group, I strongly encourage you to do so. Uh, we've formed new life groups, new study groups, and it is a great time uh, to, to gather together in, in small communities to develop friendships and bonds uh, that can last a lifetime. If you're not in a small group, you can register for that on the church website uh, right there on the homepage. As soon as you get there, uh, there is a link that you can click to submit a form, an, an interest form, and, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll get back in touch with you as far as details. Uh, if computers aren't your thing, feel free to just call the church office and we can help get you plugged in. Uh, last announcement, uh, we have the National Day of Prayer coming up on May 6th, and uh, that's a time when our country pulls together and prays for a number of different uh, aspects of, of the life we share together. One in particular is praying for the military, for uh, those who have served our country, who protect us and, and keep us safe and secure. So uh, that National Day of Prayer, May 6th, we are going to go out to the Amelia Veterans Cemetery and have a prayer service out there. If you're not the type who prays out loud, that's okay. Come, come and be with us as we join our hearts and our voices and uh, just reflect on those who have sacrificed so much. Uh, it, is, it will be a good time together. That will be in the morning, and then it's a beautiful drive, by the way. And then once you, we get back here to the church, we'll sit under the pavilion and enjoy Mission Barbecue together. They support our troops as well. So it'll be a great time for us to come together as a praying community. Uh, to lift our requests to God confidently that he has heard our prayers. And with that said, let us stand and greet one another in the name of the risen Lord. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Easter. Hi, happy Easter. Uh, I don't know. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. <laughs> Of the tomb. We 
become with ears tuned to hear the angel proclamation. Christ is not here, for he is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Our hymns of praise this morning are Christ the Lord is risen today and crown him with many crowns.
pray to you, Almighty God, on this day, you won victory over death, raising Jesus from the grave and giving us eternal life. Glory to you, our Savior, Jesus Christ. For us and our salvation, you overcame death and opened the gate to everlasting life. Though we know that the record of our transgressions has been wiped clean, we confess that we remain captive to doubt and fear, bound by the ways that lead to death. We overlook the poor and the hungry and pass by those who mourn. We are deaf to the cries of the oppressed and indifferent to calls for peace. We despise the weak and abuse the earth you made. Forgive us, God of mercy. Help us to trust your power to change our lives and make us new, that we may know the joy of life abundant given in Jesus Christ for his and Amen. Hear the good news. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins on his body on the cross that we may be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. Brothers and sisters, in the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven.
the judge of us all, and you have placed in our hands the wealth that we call our own. Through your spirit, give us wisdom, that our possessions may not be a curse, but a blessing in our lives. Accept this offering this morning as a means to bless the lives of others, through Jesus Christ our Lord. reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John. We'll be reading chapter 20, verses uh, 1 through 18, looking at the resurrection of the Lord. Uh, but before I read that, I wanted to say a special thank you to our sound team that got here uh, before sunrise this morning uh, to get everything set up, and to the deacons for all the delicious food and flowers. And everything. John 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started out for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around the cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. 
Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go and get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. What we have here is a case of mistaken identity. You know, pastors usually have kind of their own unique style. And, um, I think it's probably safe to say that uh, despite how I'm dressed this morning, uh, I probably one of the most casual pastors that have uh, been at Swift Creek. Uh, if you come up to the office during the week, you're probably more likely to see me in a polo shirt rather than a button-down or maybe even a t-shirt. I much prefer uh, shorts to long pants and sandals to dress shoes. Jesus wore sandals. <laughs> I don't say that as a comparison in terms of good or bad. One being better than the other is just uh, simply an observation. Shortly after I had started here back in uh, 2018, uh, the toilet in the restroom that is inside the, the offices had stopped working. And um, we had tried various ways to fix the problem. The trustees did, changing out valves, changing the things of that nature. Just couldn't get it solved. And so we finally pulled in a uh, plumber to come look at the problem. And uh, this plumber brought an associate with him to help. And uh, so they were in the bathroom. It's a very small bathroom. And uh, they were tr trying to figure out what exactly the problem was. And so uh, the office administrator came in and asked me to go into the bathroom with them. <laughs> so three fully grown men in a small bathroom. It was a little weird. And they asked me to describe the problem, and so I did. I was explaining that it was constantly kind of running. And uh, the associate who was with the plumber, he paused after I had described it, and he looked up and he said, so are you the janitor? <laughs> sure. I decided it was then and there that I needed to go get a clean shave and step up the dress code a little bit. Right? What we have here is a case of mistaken identity. Mary goes to the tomb to find Jesus' body. But as she approaches the tomb, she's approaching it in the dark. She sees that the stone has been rolled away, doesn't look in the tomb, doesn't go in the tomb. She just sees that the stone has been rolled away. And she makes an assumption. She draws a false narrative, a mistaken identity, about what's happened. In the Gospel of John, to be in darkness as Mary is, it, it symbolizes a lack of understanding. So Mary approaches in the dark, unable to see well, doesn't investigate all the facts, has a lack of understanding, and she develops a false narrative, a mistaken identity about Jesus. Worse yet is that she then goes and starts to tell others this misinformation. 
He goes to the disciples, Peter and John. She says, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb. And I don't know where we put it, or where they put it. It's a case of mistaken identity. So John and Peter, along with Mary, they decide to return to the room, but John and Peter want to do it as a, as a foot race, right? So they go running. They take off for the grave. John is very quick to point out, he got there first. <laughs> no ego there. John got to the tomb first. But he too stops at the entrance. He doesn't go inside. He looks, he sees linen and cloth. Then Peter catches up. We love Peter. Peter doesn't stop. He goes right into the tomb. He is ready to see what's happening. He sees cloth, linen, signs of a dead man. And then John finally musters the strength and the courage to enter into what you have to understand is that the tomb was probably about three feet tall. They weren't in there just walking around, you know, checking things out. They were on their hands and knees in the dirt, crawling in the grave. The verses say that John looked at the linen and the cloth, and then he believed. What did John believe? What did he believe had happened? Read two commentaries on this and you'll get five different answers. I think there's a pretty strong case to say that John, at that moment, did not believe Jesus had been resurrected from the dead. Think about what's happened. If, and, and scripture says right there, they did not yet understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. I believe that John believed in Mary's mistaken identity, that the body's been stolen and taken away. How, I would ask you, can you believe in new life when you're occupying the space for a dead man? How can you believe in new life when that's where you're living? Peter, we know, we, we love Peter. He's always wanting to be first at everything, except he's apparently slower than John. When Jesus is asking the disciples, who do the people say that I am? And then he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ. Peter sees an empty grave. He sees grave clothes. He's silent. He doesn't speak a word. We know Peter. He would have been the first out there declaring and proclaiming that Jesus had risen from the dead. What did John and, John and Peter do? They went back to the place they were staying. I mean, that is the most dispassionate, unexciting Reception to believing that Jesus has risen from the dead if that's in fact what they believe. I think they too had a case of mistaken identity. So Mary, she's there, left at the tomb crying. John and Peter leave a woman crying at the grave. I think that too is a sign that they had not believed in the resurrection. You don't leave a woman crying in a grave. She's standing there, tears, filling up her eyes, pouring down her cheeks. She was grieving. Yes, she was grieving Jesus' death. But she's also grieving the loss of evidence. Something that she can hold on to. She's lost the evidence of his life, his ministry, of the hope and the promise that he brought. The evidence is gone. 
So Mary not only has grief, she has utter nothingness. And then two angels appear in the grave. Two emissaries of God, two divine representatives. She doesn't even see him. It's more mistaken identity. I mean, she sees him, but she doesn't see him. The angels ask, woman, why are you crying? And she says, they've, they've taken the Lord. And I don't know where they put him. How many times in life do we stumble past God's angels sent here to bring us good news and hope and great joy? How many times in our grief do we just walk right past them? Angels here to deliver us good news. And then Mary sees who she thinks is the gardener. She's standing face to face with Jesus, the resurrected Lord. She can't even tell that it's him. Jesus asks her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? And she repeats the mistaken identity. She says, if you've moved his body, please tell me where you put him so that I can go get him and bring him back. Do you see the irony here? Mary is talking to a risen and resurrected and living Lord, asking him for the body of a dead man. She can't see it. But then Jesus uses her name. One word. Mary. And her eyes are open. That's how God works in our lives. He called each and every one of us by name. And by forming that relationship with Jesus, we can understand the scriptures. Okay? John, Peter, Paul, he knew about God. But did they know God? There's a difference. Paul was a Pharisee. He knew the scriptures, but he was persecuting people. Paul knew about God, but did he know God in Christ? It was when he had a personal encounter. And his name was Paul. That he accepted Christ. There's a difference between knowing about God and Go into any public university religious studies department. You'll find people that know this back to back, but they don't have Christ in their heart. Those are scholars, not followers. There is a link, an inseparable link, between that personal encounter with Jesus and understanding what Scripture says. About him, about God, about our purpose for being in the world. Shortly before I uh, made the transition from career in the business field to coming here to Swift Creek in ministry, I was talking to one of my clients uh, and just kind of telling him about where the Lord was leading me and the changes that were in store for my life. And he listened thoughtfully, and then he asked, uh, do you think you'll like your new boss? <laughs> I said, yeah, he's a pretty powerful guy, but he's also really forgiving as well. <laughs> if I asked you to describe yourself this morning, how would you do it? If you had to describe yourself Tell me about your job, what it is that you do for a living. If you describe yourself to me, would it be a statement about your family? Would you tell me about your job, what it is, you, or I would have said that job, uh, would you tell me about school? Where do you currently go to school, where do you want to go to college? 
where you went. Would you describe yourself in terms of sports teams, hobbies, and interests such as those? Maybe this morning you would be. And that you would call this into new and abundant life. We give you thanks for revealing yourself to Mary, to the disciples, and all of us in unique ways, in unique places. Not one of us shares the same story, except we do share the same victory. And that is that Christ Jesus, crucified on the cross, killed for our sins and our physical destructions. He was raised to new and abundant life. So we give you thanks for this. in a few minutes, Jesus gave thanks to God, even in those moments, knowing what was coming to him. While we were still sinners, Romans says, Christ died for us. Some call this communion, some call it the Lord's Supper, some call it the Eucharist. That is from the Greek. And within that word Eucharist is the word 
for grace. Our thankfulness all comes out of God's grace for us. This is not a Presbyterian table. This is not Swift Creek's table. This table has been set for all who look to Christ Jesus alone for salvation. Please be seated. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as I stand here and we feel the wind moving across our faces as it rustles leaves and our hair, I'm just reminded of your spirit moving through this church. God, I give you thanks that you are a living God, a resurrected God, that the powers of sin and death could not overcome you, but you ever overcome them. And so we give you thanks this, this morning, Lord, for all those who have shared that good news with us and for those you place in our path to share it with as well. Father, I give you thanks for the prophets of old who constantly were calling your chosen people back to God over and over again to chase us down. Lord, we give you thanks for the prophets of today who are going out into the world where there is darkness and suffering and bringing light into those places because darkness can't overcome the light. God, I give you thanks for this opportunity to gather together, to be in fellowship, above all else to be in worship of you on this most holiest of days. And so we join our voices with the saints who have gone before us and with Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, the Lord Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after he had given thanks to God, he broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat, this bread. Do that in remembrance of me. In the same manner, Jesus took a common cup that was before him, and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, sealed with my blood, shed for the remission, the forgiveness of your sins. Whenever you drink from this cup, do it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, you and I proclaim our Lord's saving death and resurrection until he comes again. Brothers and sisters, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. This morning we'll be taking communion in our seats. If by chance anyone did not receive elements, please raise your hand. And our servers will make sure that you uh, get those. Uh, as a sign of the individual faith that we have, that personal encounter when Jesus calls our name, I would ask that you take the bread prayerfully and do so when the Spirit moves you to take it. But then as a sign of the common faith that we all share in Jesus Christ, hold on to the cup, wait to take that, so that we can drink in that cup of salvation together. The table's been set. God has a place specifically for you. So come you who are hungry, come you who are thirsty. Let's dine in the presence of the Lord.
you have not yet done so, take and eat in memory. Jesus says this is the cup of the new covenant. Let us drink in the cup of salvation together. Father God, we come to you this morning grateful for the chance to share a meal together, to be fed by bread and cup us to be fed in your presence. We thank you for walking alongside us, Jesus. You come to us in the darkness. You find us at the tomb, head buried, crying, and yet you call us to a relationship with you. We thank you for that understanding and the understanding that that brings, that you have created each one of us to go and tell that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Please stand as we sing our final hymn, Christ the to us this morning. Go and tell. So go with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. 